بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وزكى التسليم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the class of Tafsir Today inshallah we'll continue the Tafsir of Surah Al Imran And we've reached Ayah 118 Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتخذوا بطانة من دونكم لا يألونكم خبالا ودوا ما عنتم قد بدت البغضاء من أفواههم وما تخفي صدورهم أكبر قد بينا لكم الآيات إن كنتم تعقلون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah O you who believe take not as advisors those other than your own since they will not fail to do their best to corrupt you they desire to harm you severely hatred has already appeared from their mouths but what their breasts conceal is far worse. Indeed, we made plain to you the ayat if you understand. In this ayah, we have a prohibition, a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to take the kuffar as advisors. The term, the Arabic term was bitana. Bitana is the internal thing. That is, that is not outward, but it is from inward. And it is translated as advisors. So what kind of advisors Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prohibiting us from taking? Allah says, لا تتخذوا بطانة من دونكم. We need to, to understand the ayah correctly. We need to know what's the context. What time this ayah was revealed. What are the circumstances? That will always help us understand better the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the believers not to take the kuffar as advisors. And he mentioned the reason. Since they will not fail to do their best to corrupt you. They will do their best to corrupt us. What if they want? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say they will do their best? Who are the kuffar that are meant in this ayah? All the kuffars, part of them, who are they? This ayah meant in particular the hypocrites. Especially the hypocrites. Because remember in Medina, there were many hypocrites. When Islam came, and Muslims became strong, many people announced that they are Muslims while they did not really accept Islam. What happened? Those kuffar, those hypocrites, they tried their best to corrupt the believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah their methods. What did they do? When they meet the believers, they say we believe. When they leave, they say we don't believe. When they are alone, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prohibiting us from taking the kuffar as advisors. What are the limits for this prohibition? Is it general in everything? A Muslim man, a business man, he owns a company and he has a chief advisor. That's his title. Who is a non-Muslim? Is that permissible or not? How do you apply this ayah? Do you come and tell that owner? Allah says in the Quran, do not take the disbelievers as advisors. And you did it. So you are a sinner. Yes or no? What are the applications of this ayah? You said that uh, the tongue, I think, it means something internal. Yeah. Yeah, just like the bitana of the thawb. When you have a piece of cloth, shirt, dress, and it has something from inside, that's the bitana. So you are taking him close, consultant. Is that general? Or it is only in matters of religion? Hmm? 
only in matters of religion. But what is the evidence? The ayah is general. We have many companies where if you hire someone from a specific religion, won't he do his best to hire only his own people? So, it, yes. Well, it says that uh, hatred has already appeared from their mouth. Yes, again, that's the, the very important thing. In order to understand the ayah, you need to continue. Allah says, Hatred has already appeared from their mouths. But what their breasts conceal is far worse. And that's why we said this ayah meant in particular the hypocrites. How hatred came out of their mouths? There are examples. In several times, the hypocrites announced their hatred to the Prophet ﷺ and to the believers. One example, when Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, he said, when we come back to Medina, the most honored one will exile the lower one. And he meant himself that he will kick out the Prophet ﷺ. Any incident where there is a call for the believers to do something, you will find the hypocrites putting down the believers in the battle of Al-Ahzab. وَإِذْ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ مَا وَعَدَنَا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا This is another example. So this, this is the hatred. And that's the reason why you don't take them as advisors. Because they hate you. They will do their best to fail you. And you have seen this from their mouths. Which means that the hearts are hiding much more. And there is an evidence here that usually if you have a belief, it will come out on your mouth. But that's not the case always. But in general, that's what happens. The tongue expresses what you have in your heart. And sometimes you say, oh, that's a slip of a tongue. And that could be true, but many times it is not. If you did not have this feeling, if you did not have this belief, you wouldn't have said what you said. Now, Allah mentioned the reason. Allah said, do not take them as advisors. Don't tell them about the secrets. Don't take them as advisors. Don't, don't ask their help because they will fail you. You want their help, but you won't get it. They will fail you. What if they won't? They won't fail us. But on the contrary, they will help us. Is this condition or is this prohibited for that condition? Which means if that condition is not there, the prohibition is lifted and it is not there anymore. Yes or no? Why not? You said uh, if they don't harm you, then it's okay. Now I'm asking, if that true? If they won't harm us, is it okay? That's that's a hidden wisdom that Allah. Uh, that it's not hidden anymore. It is there. Allah mentioned it. It's not hidden wisdom. I'm saying He's informing us of something that they will do. So we think that they will treat us good, but mm -hmm. Allah is telling us don't use them as to give them as advisors because they will treat you wrong. Yeah, because they will treat us wrong. What if they did not treat us wrong? It, it could still occur, but we think that it's not occurring. Yes, this is what we call blocking the means, the reasons for doing something haram. Do not say, I will take my chances. This guy seems good, so I will tell him the secrets. We have a war between the believers and the disbelievers, and he is my advisor. Allah says, no. Okay, if that's the case, how would the Prophet ﷺ himself seek the help of the kuffar? Did he do it or he did not? He did. An example? Can you think of an example? You just said he did. How you say he did if you don't know? He took protection and jiwar when he came from Ataif. Well, that's way before. We're talking now in 
the Medina and Iraq. Didn't he agree with the Jews for help, support? So how do you understand the ayah then? We're talking about the hypocrites. So the hypocrites only, it is forbidden. Jews and Christians is allowed. Won't Jews and Christians also fail us? Didn't actually that's what they did? They agreed with the Muslims to defend Medina while they turned against the Muslims and they stabbed them in their backs in the Battle of Al Ahzab. Didn't they conspire against the Prophet ﷺ and the believers? Case by case basis. It's not case by case. How do we establish the ruling from the ayah? What do we say? Someone read the ayah. What's the correct understanding of the ayah? Do not take advisors. Again, that's the importance of knowing the context of the ayah. It is talking about the hypocrites in particular, but everyone in general. Now, if you say the Prophet ﷺ sought the help of the Jews, what other options did he have at that time? People are living with you, you have to agree with them. You have to have an agreement, some kind of agreement. Either you fight them or you allow for them to be in your side. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ did. Even nowadays, it could happen. Now, I did not take them as advisors. Taking them as advisors is different. Seeking their help is permissible. But when I have my own system, and I allow for someone to be in that system, that's what is prohibited. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the believers. Because again, at the time of the Messenger وسلم, maybe matters were not clear who is a believer and who is hypocrite. But the believers, the companions, they knew that some of them, some of those hypocrites, in every now and then they are talking badly about the Prophet وسلم, about the Muslims. And those are the ones that are meant by this ayah at the first place and then everyone else Umar radiallahu an again we learn the ayah by the actions of the companions Umar radiallahu an he was offered a man who was a writer and remember at their time not many people wrote so they advised him they told him take him as your writer what's the job of the scribe or writer he sends letters to the rulers, mayors around the Arabia and the Muslim land. Did Umar radiallahu anh agree? He said, no. If I did that, then I took advisors of the kuffar and I disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he did not. That's how we understand it. The matters that we fear in our religion, we are not allowed to take advisors of the disbelievers. While in, in dunya, in transactions, it is permissible. That's not meant by the ayah. Prophet ﷺ dealt with the uh, kuffar, the disbelievers. When you deal with someone that does not make you, taking him as an advisor. But in the matters of the religion, that's what they will do. They will fail us. Why it is different, the matters of dunya, than the matters of religion? Because the matters of the dunya, we agree on the cause. I want to make money and you want to make money, right? So it doesn't really matter who you are. We have the same cause. But in matters of religion, I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I believe that the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger of Allah. You don't believe in him. How we agree and how can we help each other? We won't. So we should not take advisors. That's the meaning of the ayah. They desire to harm you severely. That's their desire. That may not be true about every single disbeliever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us in the Quran that Laysu sawa, they are not equal. But you don't take chances. In matters of religion, you don't seek the help of others. How about the Prophet ﷺ seeking the help of Abdullah bin Urayqit, al Laythi, Dili? He was a disbeliever, right? Yet, he guided the Prophet ﷺ in his trip. Why? First, again, 
Abdullah was trustworthy. And the Prophet ﷺ was prepared. And he asked him his help in a specific thing. And that happened before or during the time of migration, before moving to Medina. Once you are established, you have your own system, you have your own state, then you are not allowed to take a disbeliever as advisor. So we can say in our terms nowadays, in the high positions of authority, you're not allowed to take disbelievers, appoint them as advisors. Why? Because they may fail you. And they don't love you. They show hatred. Even if they did not show it, they have it in their hearts. Hatred has already appeared from their mouths. But what their breasts conceal is far worse. And that's the case of the hypocrites in particular. And it could be applied to other people as well. Indeed, we made plain to you the ayat, if you understand. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ha antum, tuhibbunahum wa la yuhibbunakum. Lo, you are the ones who love them, but they love you not. Do we really love the disbelievers? Do we love them or we don't love them? You don't love them? How do we love the disbelievers? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember, is talking to the companions of the Messenger وسلم. How would the companions love the disbelievers? Yes, because they are their relatives. They are their they tribesmen, they are their families. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding them that even if you love them, you wish the good for them, you want them to be guided. We love the disbelievers, natural love. There is nothing wrong with it. We wish for them the welfare to accept Islam, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they don't love us. And that's the case again with the hypocrites. Did the hypocrites love the believers? No. They tried every now and then to mislead them. They attempted to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. They conspired against the believers. How would then they love them? They retreated from the battle of Uhud, one third of the army, under the leadership of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. And actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not condemning the love, if it's natural. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, Ha antum, how la yuhibbunahum, wa la yuhibbunakum, wa tu'minuna bil kitabi kulli, and you believe in all the scriptures. Kitab was mentioned in the singular form in Arabic, kitab, while here it says scriptures, kutub. Kitab is one, kutub is plural. So here in all the scriptures, do we say the translation is wrong? No, in Arabic it says, Hantum how to وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْكِتَابِ كُلِّهِ You believe in the book as whole, not in the books or in the scripture. What do we say here? If you believe in one book, that entails you should believe in all books. If you disbelieve in one book, that means you automatically disbelieved in all books. Believing in the Quran necessitates that you believe in all other books. So there is really no contradiction, even if it's, it was in Arabic in the singular form, and you said in English scriptures, it is the same. If you believe in the Quran, you believe in other scriptures. And when they meet you, they say, we believe. Again, that's an evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about who? The hypocrites, because those are the ones they were described at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah. وَإِذَا لَقُوكُمْ قَالُوا أَمَنَّا وَإِذَا خَلَوْا عَضُّوا عَلَيْكُمْ لَنَامِلَ مِنَ الْغَيْظِ وَإِذَا لَقُوكُمْ قَالُوا أَمَنَّا But 
when they are alone, when they are alone, وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ That's what's mentioned there in Surah Al-Baqarah. When they are alone with their devils. Here, when they are alone, they bite their fingers at you in rage. Why they are enraged? Why the hypocrites are so upset? Because again, they don't love us. When they see us strong, that means they are weak. When they see us victorious, that means they are defeated. They don't want anything good for the Muslims. So when they are with you, and they are seeing your state of love, of cooperation, of unity, they cannot stand that. Once they are alone, they are enraged, and they are upset. What was the response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? قُلْ مُوتُ بِغَيْضِكُمْ Say, perish in your rage. Why? It won't affect us. You hate us, you love us, we don't care. We obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we care about the love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever happened after that, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, perish in your rage. Certainly Allah knows what is in your قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ قُلْ مُوتُ بِغَيْضِكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إِن تَمْسَسْكُمْ حَسَنَةٌ تَسُؤْهُمْ If a good befalls you, it grieves them. Why? The hypocrites accepted Islam with their mouths only, hoping that one day Islam will be over. So they can announce again their own beliefs that they did not believe in Islam. But every time Islam is getting stronger, that means their chances are gone to reveal what they are concealing. So once a good thing happens, they are unhappy with it because they don't believe in what you believe. It is just like you are sitting to someone next to you and you have to be on the same level. Otherwise, both of you will lose. But he is waiting for the first chance to turn against you. And every time you grow stronger, he is weaker. He hates you more. If a good befalls you, it grieves them. But if some evil overtakes you, they rejoice at it. In tamsaskum hasanatun tasu'um. وَإِن تُصِبْكُمْ سَيَّاتٌ يَفْرَحُوا بِهَا But if you remain patient, وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا And have taqwa, لَا يَضُرُّكُمْ كَيْدُهُمْ شَيْئًا Not the least harm will their cunning do to you. So we should not really pay attention to their feelings. And this is an instruction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the believers. Not only at the time of the Messenger وسلم, but even nowadays in our time. Now, it is good to know what the kuffar are plotting against the Muslims. What are their plans? But at the same time, you have to care more about what you're doing. Because nowadays, some people, all their effort is to observe the disbelievers, what they are doing. Or study their books, their methodology. And that's to some extent, may be helpful. But not at the expense of your own beliefs or your own mandatory work that you should do. Imagine someone in a race, and instead of strengthening himself, practicing, he is looking at the other competitors, what they are doing. Would he win the race? Chances are no. Yes, you need to know what the plans of others, but you need to improve yourself. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the believers. Be patient, have taqwa. If we are strong, they won't harm us. Again, how to implement this in da'wah nowadays? Increase your knowledge. Improve your character. And people will listen to you. Yes, it may be helpful to know what people are saying about Islam. They are attacking Islam, how to defend it. But it is more important to know your own beliefs. What are they? وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا لَا يَضُرُّكُمْ كَيْدُهُمْ شَيْئًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the believers, do not worry. 
Let them do whatever they want. Let them be happy. Islam is under attack. Muslims are killed. The Prophet ﷺ is offended. Let them be happy. Do your job and they won't harm you. And that's what happened. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, that's what happened. Every time the believers are superior, are winning a round of the war, the hypocrites are more upset. But that did not harm the believers. And eventually, Islam prevailed. And it will prevail. So do not worry much about their feelings. Surely Allah surrounds all that they do. Everything happens, it happens by the leave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything happens with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So do not think that if they said something and they concealed another thing, that it is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows what's happening. Allah will take care of it. So do your job. Again, this is, these ayat are really important to remind us how to deal with our own issues. Are we allowed to have a disbeliever as an advisor or not? Is it only in matters of religion or it is extended in everything? How the Muslims at the time of the Messenger وسلم, dealt with that situation where they had hypocrites, where they had Jews, and they had the companions. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ غَدَوْتَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ تُبَوِّئُ الْمُؤْنِينَ مَقَاعِدَ لِلْقِتَالِ وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ And remember, when you left your household in the morning to post the believers at their stations for the battle. And Allah is all hearer, all knower. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about battle. Because Allah is reminding the Prophet Sallallahu when he positioned and deployed the believers to take their stations. And that's a reminder of the job of the leader. And the Prophet Sallallahu was a true leader. The chief in command should be the first one to lead the army. And that was what the Prophet Sallallahu did. He told the companions, you are here, you are there. You are in this position, you are in that position. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet وسلم, when he placed and posted the people in their positions. But what battle is this one? Hmm? Ahud? Ahud or Badr? Ahud? Why? Didn't he do... Th he did that in Badr. And Uhud. So why you say Uhud? I like Badr. Is it Badr or Uhud? Hmm. Online, what do you say? If you say Badr, why? If you say Uhud, why? Why? Someone asked you why. Which battle is this one? That's why you cannot snatch and take one ayah and interpret it and say this is the meaning. Look forward. The next ayah, what does it say? From this ayah actually by itself, you cannot say it is Badr or Uhud. You cannot say. There are some indications, yes, but they are not definite. Why? Because even in Badr, that's what happened. However, in Badr, they were not planning for fighting. So that may be an indication. But the stronger evidence is in the next ayah. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ هَمَّتْ طَائِفَتَانِ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ تَفْشَلَ When two parties from among you were about to lose heart. And that did not happen in the battle of Badr. But rather it happened in the battle of Uhud. Which means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about which battle? Uhud. The battle of Uhud. What happened in the battle of Uhud? The Prophet ﷺ consulted with the companions. What do you think? The adults, the old ones, they said, 
we have to stay. That's better. The youth, they said, no, we need to go. We won't wait for the kuffar to come to us. So the Prophet ﷺ agreed with the youth. They were majority. And he placed the people in their position. Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul, who was a hypocrite, he was not happy with that decision. Once the people took their positions, he withdrew with one third of the army. Now when he retreated, again remember that affects the believers. Imagine if the Prophet ﷺ placed Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul as the leader for that army, uh, for that battle. What would happen? The Muslim would be defeated. Because you placed someone in a position of authority while he's not worthy. He doesn't deserve that position. And that's why it is very dangerous to put someone in authority position while he's not qualified, while he is a disbeliever. When Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul retreated, some of the believers, they did not know what to do. Two groups of them, they wanted to follow. But what happened? But Allah was their wali. Allah was their supporter. Allah was their helper. Why? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wasn't the wali of the hypocrites of one third of the army? That reminds you the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the help when it comes when you need it. If you are a believer, even if you fall, if you did a mistake, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save you. That's why whenever you give a charity in the time of prosperity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remember you in the time of adversity. But if you forgot about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and once you are in need and then you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you may get and you may not. And that's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those two groups, they were believers. They hesitated and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirmed and assured their hearts. And actually, Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, he, he was one, uh, in one of those groups. And he said, I would not love that this ayah did not reveal. I would not love that we did not intend to retreat. Why? Because there is an evidence in this ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their wali. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their helper. If it did not happen, they may not know. And this ayah may not have been revealed. So it shows you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the believers. It shows you that you should be always with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will be with you. Even if you sleep, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save you. Allah does not forget what you did in the past. And that's why most likely the people who did good in their final days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will guide them to say the correct word. But if for your entire life, you were opposing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you were disobeying, then how do you expect guidance? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was their wali, their helper, their supporter. So they did not withdraw. And in Allah should the believers put their trust in all matters. In all matters, matters of religion, matters of dunya, in war, in business, in studies, in everything. You put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has already made you victorious at Badr. When you were a weak little force. I just said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about which battle? Uhud or Badr? Uhud. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, and Allah has already made you victorious at Badr. So, already made you victorious. So, again, that's the beauty of the style of the Quran. Someone would come and say, oh, we are, I'm confused. No, don't be confused. This is the series. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet ﷺ of what happened in the battle of Uhud. This is what happened. Two groups were intending to withdraw, but they were able to stay fast. And remember, in the battle of Badr also. That's the style of the Quran. That's beautiful. And Allah has already made you victorious at Badr. So Allah mentioned the battle of Uhud and then he mentioned the battle of Badr. Again, the Quran is not a book of history. 
that the incidents are mentioned have to be in order. First, better than Uhud. It doesn't happen this way. Even in one story, story of Musa alayhi salam, sometimes it starts from the birth of Musa alayhi salam, sometimes it starts from the end. The story of Isa alayhi salam, sometimes it starts from the birth of his mother, sometimes it starts later on. It depends on what you can draw as a benefit from it, not as a historical incident. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about the battle of Uhud, but then he mentioned also the battle of Badr. And Allah has already made you victorious at Badr. When you were a weak little force, what happened in the battle of Badr? The Muslims were weak. The Kuffar were three times outnumbering the Muslims. The Muslims were 314 or 317, and the Kuffar were almost 1,000. But what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave victory to the believers. So do not think that if you are less, that means you will be defeated. Victory comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not from your own strength, from your own power. You have to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So have taqwa of Allah that you may be grateful. وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَذِلَّةٌ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ If Allah gave you the victory, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped you, you should be appreciative, you should be grateful. How you do that? By thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, sometimes people, when they get promoted, when they get what they wanted, they asked for, Instead of being appreciative, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's celebrate. Is that how you show your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us in this ayah that when we get what we ask for, we should be appreciative. We should obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have taqwa. Fear Allah more. That you may be grateful. So the one who does not have taqwa, he's not grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who does not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is not grateful. If taqulu lil mu'minin, when you said to the believers, when did the Prophet ﷺ say that to the believers? Alayn yakfiyakum, is it not enough for you that your Lord should help you with 3,000 angels sent down? إذ تقول للمؤمنين ألي يكفيكم أن يمدكم ربكم بثلاثة آلاف من الملائكة مرسلين Is this in battle of Badr or Uhud? Badr. It is still in Badr. Yes, we, we mentioned what happened in Uhud but now this is continuation to the previous ayah. So it is the battle of Badr. If taqulu lil mu'minin, alayn yakfiyakum an yumiddakum rabbukum bi thalathati alafin min al malaikati munzalin. 3,000 angels. You asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help, and Allah gave you the help. The help could be spiritual help, assuring your heart. It could be physical help. Did the angels come? Yes, they came, and they were seen by people. And that's the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are a true believer, if you have taqwa, Allah will help you. But if you hold on to patience and have taqwa, بَلَا إِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا وَيَأْتُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْرِهِمْ هَذَا يُمْدِدْكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ بِخَمْسَةِ آلَافٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُسَوِّمِينَ But if you hold on to patience and have taqwa, and the enemy comes rushing at you, your Lord will help you with 5,000 angels having marks. They have signs. What were the signs? Some scholars mentioned that the signs of the angels were in their horses, the white ends of the legs of the horses. Others mention different things. And again, that's why the Quran does not mention what are these marks. 
There are marks, that's it. That's the point behind mentioning this. There are marks with, what, with which you will know that this is not a human, this is angel. Now the previous ayah says how many angels? 3,000. In this ayah, it says how many? 5,000. So how many were sent? Three or five? Three or five? And why is this? Isn't that confusing? Isn't that confusing? Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say it is 5,000 and that's it, or 3,000 and that's it? Why this confusion? Again, that's very beautiful. And it needs some reflection. You need to read. Go back and read the ayah and this ayah. What happened? That's what happened. The believers were much less than the kuffar. And they were not intending to fight. They did not expect that they will fight the disbelievers. But then when they met and they saw that they are much more than them, the Prophet ﷺ reminded them that they have to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةٍ كَثِيرًا How many times a small group defeated larger group? So he gave them the glad tidings. If you steadfast, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the help. But if you show patience more, what will happen? You will get more. And that's again, that's the beauty. Just like incentive. When I tell you, study, and if you get 10 out of 15, this is what you will get. But if you get 15, that's what you will get. Why didn't I say from the beginning, if you got 15, that's what you will get? Again, it's more better and it, it will push you more. If you rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll get 3,000. But if you show more patience, you stay fast, you'll get 5,000. That's beautiful style. And people, when they talk about reward and punishment, they need to, to refer to the ways that are mentioned in the Quran. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about the battle of Badr. That 5,000 angels were sent with marks with signs. And this happened. Nowadays, if someone came and complained and said, we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help, but we don't get it. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send help to us? Who is in more need for help? We or the companions? Who's weaker? We or the companions? We are weaker, right? So shouldn't we get more help than the companions? If the companions got 5,000, we should get 50,000, right? Why we're not getting them? Hmm? They are more strong, right? So, okay, so what's the solution? Patience. We have to be more patient. So which means we have to strengthen our religion. We want the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In tansurullah yansurkum, there is condition. If we fulfill that condition, we will get the help. If we did not fulfill it, we should not complain. We should not say, oh, we're not getting help, we should get help. Is it possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send angels? The answer is yes, we don't know. Many people say, yeah, we saw angels. We say maybe. Some scholars said the angels did not fight except in the battle of Badr. Because the believers at that time, they needed the help most. In other times, angels were sent, but they did not fight. And some scholars say, no, the angels were not sent. Only in the battle of Badr. So again, these ayat, they are glad tidings they are not only historical incidents, stories that we are reading. They are lessons for us. That this is what happened to the believers. And it could happen to us. But we have to work. And we have to support the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, 
وَمَا جَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بُشْرَى And Allah made it not but as a message of good news, glad tidings for you, and as an assurance to your hearts. Again, when you have more people, they will encourage you to steadfast, to fight. But if the case was everyone is withdrawing, why should you stay? You will withdraw also. So when you know that there are people coming, there are angels fighting with you in your side, these are glad tidings. And there is no victory except from Allah. وَمَنْ نَصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ The victory is not by having the nuclear power. The victory is not by increasing your muscles, your weight. Yes, that's a cause. It could help. But victory by itself will not come except from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you want victory? Please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not getting victory? That means you're not pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is something wrong happening. You may say, well, I did my part. And that's true. Maybe it's not you. Maybe the others. It's not enough to improve yourself. The others who are with you also have to be good. وَمَنْ نَصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ The Almighty, the All-Wise. لِيَقْطَعَ طَرَفًا مِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَوْ يَكْبِتَهُمْ فَيَنْقَلِبُوا خَائِبِينَ That he might cut off a part of those who disbelieve. Or expose them to infamy so that they retire frustrated. I don't know about frustrated, maybe a better word is disappointed, defeated. What do you have it there? Same, frustrated. I mean, well, Allah mentioning the reason, especially now again we're talking about the battle of Badr. The kuffar came arrogant, showing off. They even refused to go back. Though they knew that the caravan was safe, especially Abu Jahl. He was told, let's go back. We came to protect the caravan and the caravan is protected and it is safe. He said, no, we have to teach them a lesson. But indeed, he is the one who learned the lesson. And he is the one who was killed. And in war, in the battlefield, there are many lessons learned. And nowadays, again, we are lacking part of our religion. Because not all aspects of Islam are implemented. So one of the reasons, one of the benefits of the war if we do not have any solution and we fought the disbelievers, is that we will be victorious. We will overcome them. And it will affect not only their numbers, but it will affect their feelings also. They will return frustrated, disappointed, losing. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ أو يتوب عليهم أو يعذبهم فإنهم ظالمون Not for you is the decision whether he turns in mercy to them or punishes them verily they are the wrongdoers What does this ayah mean? And what's the occasion to mention this ayah to place it among those ayat after the ayat that were just mentioned? Not for you is the decision. What decision? Whether he turns in mercy to them or punishes them, verily they are the wrongdoers. Bounty. And that was when Badr. It's not talking about bounty here. It's talking about mercy or punishment. How? No. There is a reason for the revelation of this ayah. 
And actually this ayah is about the battle of Uhud. Again, see how the Quran is moving from one battle to another battle. Why is this confusion? It is not confusion. It is about the lessons that you learn. It is a great lesson to the believers. First, the Quran is starting off with the battle of Uhud. Then, for a reason, the mentioning of the battle of Badr. And then you go back to the essential point. Just like when you're talking about subject, fiqh. You're talking about fiqh, then you mention something off topic and you digress. Are you going to continue or you go back? You go back and that's what happened here. That's why later on the details will be mentioned about which battle? Badr or Uhud? Uhud. What happened in the battle of Uhud? The Prophet ﷺ was injured. And the kuffar were close to kill him. But they were unable to. But what happened? The teeth of the Messenger ﷺ were broken. The ring of his helmet was inside his cheek. He was bleeding. And it was a difficult situation. So the Prophet ﷺ said, those people which were his people, the people of Quraysh, who did that to him, how would they be successful? How would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them after they did what they did to their Prophet? So the response came right away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show you the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To remind the Prophet sallallahu that his job is only to convey the message. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who guides or causes people to be misguided. It is not up to you. The decision of forgiveness or mercy is not for you. And this again is a lesson for all of us. Don't judge people. Don't say this one, he won't be forgiven. If it was said to the Prophet ﷺ not to judge people, how would you then come and say this one will not be forgiven or that one will be forgiven? It is not your call. It is not your decision. Whether he turns in mercy to them. Is it possible? People that they fought the Prophet ﷺ for 13 years in Mecca and three years already now, 16 years, they are fighting Islam and the Prophet ﷺ. Is it possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would turn to them in mercy? And the answer is yes. And it happened. Abu Sufyan, who was the leader of the kuffar in this battle, he accepted Islam. So look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether he turns in mercy to them or punishes them, verily they are the wrongdoers. Which means if they were punished, they deserved it. Why? Because they are wrongdoers. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive them. And that's a manifestation of the vastness of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah says in the divine narrative, my mercy overcomes my wrath, my punishment, this is an evidence for it. If they were punished, they deserve the punishment. Verily, they are truly the wrongdoers. Yet Allah may turn in mercy to them. And that happened to some of them. Some of the disbelievers at that battle became Muslims, just like Abu Sufyan, who was the leader. Wahshi, the killer of Hamza radiallahu an, the uncle of the messenger sallallahu didn't he accept Islam? So look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the difference between Islam and other religions. Between Islam and any secular system. No matter how horrible your action was, you may be forgiven totally. But in our times, we don't have this. If you do something wrong, even if you are punished, it is still in your record. It is still in your file. Well, that's not the case in Islam. Again, stressing this point. And to Allah belongs all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth. He forgives whom He wills. And punishes whom he wills. 
whatever in heavens and earth belongs to us or to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Isn't that your pen or Allah's pen? Our possession is incomplete. It is temporary. It comes and goes. But the possession of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is permanent. It is the complete ownership. It is a true ownership. And He is the one who forgives or punishes. So it is not your decision. Even when you punish, you are punishing not because you want to punish, but because that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. So again, this is a reminder that when you punish, you're not punishing because you want to or you forgive. You obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You apply the rulings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He forgives whom He wills and punishes whom He wills. And Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. Wallahu ghafoorur rahim. Again, look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the beauty of the Quran. If Allah punishes and forgives, it would be suitable to say, and Allah is the one who punishes or forgives. But rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, and Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. To show you that forgiveness is much more than punishment. To show you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to forgive. Even for the one who did the most grievous sin, disbelieving in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He could be forgiven if he repented and asked for repentance sincerely. We'll stop here, inshallah. Is there any question? Yes. Um, from the first uh, discussion, mm -hmm. um, do not take advices in matters of deen, but when it comes to Islam, uh, uh, doing your things is okay. It is permissible, yeah. Not in matters of religion. What is, what is matters of religion? Like for instance, the, like uh, if I go to a financial advisor mm -hmm. to tell me I need to invest in these stocks and bonds, I need to open some uh, interest-bearing accounts. Yeah. Okay. This is the, this is the, you know a, a non-religious thing in, gen in general. We say non-religious, but in, in essence, it is religious because our whole life is religious. Yeah. So. Yeah, but again, when you take advisor for a financial uh, transaction. He may advise you with something that is totally haram. Yes, he may advise you with something that is haram. So it becomes religious or non-religious. You go to a, a sheikh, scholar, and you ask him for advice, but he doesn't know anything. Right. So what do you do? Do you, you don't invest because you are forbidden? No, we say in principle you are allowed to. But he may advise you with something that is haram. In this case, you have also to take the advice of the scholar, the one who has knowledge. So you don't fall in what's haram. But at the same time, going and asking people for their advice, is it forbidden? The answer is no. You want to invest and no one tells you you cannot invest except by a Muslim's advice. Just like when you go to a doctor. Isn't it possible that the doctor may recommend a medicine that, is, that includes alcohol? It is possible. Does that mean you cannot go to a non-Muslim doctor? The answer is no. Is it clear? Still? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we'll stop here, inshallah.